Hi, everybody. Welcome to AABA webinar series. Uh, just a couple quick notes. We are recording this and it will be going on the AABA website. And the second comment is that if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A box and we will get to those. And with that, I will turn it over to Eduardo. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us at, for our webinar, Understanding Genetic Ancestry and its Implications. Our objective with this webinar is to examine what genetic ancestry means and also to discuss the nuances and limitations of this concept. The talks will be given by three different experts in human genetics and population genetics, and the speakers will approach topics such as community engagement, the use of genetic ancestry in human genetics, and also the implication of genetic ancestry in biomedical research. This webinar is being hosted by the American Association of Biological Anthropologists, the AABA, and also the American Association of Anthropological Genetics, the AAAG. I would like to take this opportunity um, to advertise the um, or remind everyone uh, that the AABA's annual meeting is happening in Reno in April 2023, and we'll have both a virtual and also an in-person components. You can scan the QR code on the screen for more information, also for registration. And if you would like to sponsor our um, meeting, uh, please email uh, the email in the bottom of the slide, AABA sponsors at berkinc.com. And this includes both the industry and also academic programs. Um, and I will also take the opportunity to spread the word about Triple AG. That's the first webinar that we are organizing together with the AABA. We are a professional association of anthropological geneticists, and we aim to promote the study and training of anthropological genetics. We do a few different activities throughout the year, including this webinar in collaboration with the AABA. In January or February, we're going to be organizing another webinar on community engagement. Um, and we also do workshops on genomics. Uh, we have an online journal club and also a symposium and a networking event in, um, at the AABAs. If you're interested to learn more about us, about the association, um, and possibly becoming a member, please scan the QR code and follow us on Twitter. It's triple A genetics. Um, it's in the bottom of the slide. And uh, with that, I just want to quickly introduce the speakers. Uh, this is gonna be the program today. Um, we're gonna have three talks. Each one is gonna be around 15 minutes. And at the end, we're gonna have a Q&A session. Um, and we encourage everyone to submit their questions using the online platform. Um, uh, the first speaker is, is gonna be Dr. Janina Jeff. She has a PhD from Vanderbilt and is a population geneticist and host of the In Those Genes podcast. The second speaker will be uh, Dr. Graham Coop. Um, he has a PhD from Oxford and he's a professor in the Department of Evolution and Ecology at UC Davis. And last we have um, uh, Dr. Jen Wojcik, she has a PhD from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she's currently an assistant professor of epidemiology. It's my pleasure to have you here, and I'll pass the mic to Dr. Janina Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone. I am going to be talking to you about how we how genetic ancestry uh, really has been a tool to engage with diverse populations. Uh, I'm going to be using my podcast in those genes to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done at In Those Genes and give a little current landscape of, of this topic. Um, just a quick disclosure, all opinions and topics are my own and do not reflect those of my employer. But I want to kind of start off with what the current uh, genomic literacy is. So genetic ancestry testing or consumer genetic testing has been very, very, a, a really strong marketing tool for engaging with diverse communities particularly uh, when direct-to-consumer genetic ancestry tests were first kind of um, gaining popularity. Uh, ironically, they were not gaining popularity in diverse communities. And I may maybe that's not so ironic. Um, one of the reasons were that there were huge cost barriers um, in doing these tests. So at the time when they first started, some of these tests would reach up to even $1,000, but most of them were a couple of hundred dollars. And if we think about the use of the test then, a lot of the use of the test were mostly for what we call recreational genetics. And this where um, anyone can order a test directly as a consumer and find out, uh, we said that they were recreational because these were things that were most of the times not scientific. In this case, kind of how genetics can describe different traits. One of the things that uh, these tests became extremely well popular 
for was being able to report genetic ancestry. So I'm not going to go into the definition of genetic ancestry and genetic similarity. I think um, Graham is probably going to do a really deep dive there. But in short, genetic ancestry gives a picture of the amount of genetic information you share with common ancestors. And so this became a tool that became very, very exciting, particularly in the Black community, as most descendants uh, who live in the Americas who identify as Black are also descendants of slaves. And if we know a little bit of the history of enslavement in that period, we know a lot of these individuals do not have access or information about their ancestors. And this is mostly because of slave trading, um, also because you know, a, a systemic racism and a lot of practices in place to, you know, really not document that information. And so consumer genetic ancestry testing became really uh, very popular in the Black community because this was somewhat of a non-biased way to get information about your ancestry and to kind of answer this question about where you are from. Uh, it also became something that, you know, I saw as an opportunity uh, to engage with diverse communities because it was kind of through this avenue that um, most uh, most most people in the diverse uh, diverse community world became interested in genomics. And so uh, one of the reasons why this is a barrier is because the scientific community really uses non-inclusive language that's pretty technical and dense, and most importantly, that is culturally insensitive. And so, uh, back then, there were a lot of incentive by several companies of giving away free, quote unquote, uh, consumer genetic tests. And I say that in quotations because someone once told me, anytime you get something for free, as I said, reporting genetic ancestry uh, began, began to be a way for these direct-to-consumer companies to really market their tests. So there were a lot of initiatives to give free tests to uh, populations of non-European descent. And uh, the interest there is, you know, being able to improve genetic studies, having diverse populations as a part of these data sets really does accelerate things like drug discovery. And so a lot of these direct-to-consumer companies knew that, and also to improve their own reporting of, of results from these tests, needed to have diverse samples. And so in 2019, um, one of these direct-to-consumer companies released an ad, and this ad, we, we at the podcast made an episode on really talking about how direct-to-consumer genetic ancestry tests are marketed to non-European populations. And so really briefly, I'm gonna play this and hopefully- Abigail, we can escape to the North. I don't There's know. a place we can be together across the border. Will you leave with me? Uncover the lost chapters of your family history with Ancestry. Get started for free at Ancestry.ca. The ad called Inseparable conveys a slavery era love story between an unnamed white man and a seemingly enslaved black woman named Abigail. It's an ahistorical telling of a narrative we know all too well. The ad was pulled shortly after going viral and Ancestry.com explained that Ancestry is committed to telling important stories from history. This ad was intended to represent one of these stories. Interesting. So this is an example of one of the genetic ancestry or direct consumer genetic ancestry testing ads that was uh, tone deaf. Um, and so, using this um, this ad as an example of how direct to consumer uh, companies begin to engage with diverse communities, particularly the Black community. Uh, was very, very problematic, namely uh, because as we as geneticists are trying to create trust and trying to uh, be transparent about what genetics can and can't do, this marketing ad was an example of how we're using a historical concepts to kind of lure diverse communities into engaging with genomics research. And so one of the things that my work does um, is really trying to change that. And so in 2018, I created In Those Genes podcast, which is a podcast that uses genetics to decode 
the lost histories and futures of African descendants. And I want to take a, a, a moment to say, even I, when doing this work, have needed to change a lot of my language and, and theories. When I first started the podcast, our, you know, our tagline was uh, in those genes of the podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost histories of African descendants. And we've now changed that mostly because the histories of any person um, are really not lost or the identities are not lost. These identities may not be fully defined and explained by genetics or one may not have the information around their genomics to talk about their genetic identity. But in that statement and in the statement that a lot of these direct-to-consumer genetic ancestry companies use, it's kind of this idea that our history or that our identities do not exist if we do not have genetic information, which is not true. And so one of the things that my show does is try to create a safe space, particularly for Black people who want to understand their identity better through genetics. We very much so want to emphasize, though, that our identity can not only be tied to genetics and our identity is not only limited to genetics. It also includes history. It also includes thinking about our futures. But really, the show is meant to be a uh, very inclusive and accessible tool for anyone who's trying to learn genomics. Um, a part of this work also kind of extends to dispelling myths. So going back to that direct-to-consumer genetic ancestry ad, uh, one of the myths that is in that ad is that a lot of African descent people who have European ancestry in their genomes as a consequence of uh, love between uh, someone who identifies as European, of, as European descent versus someone who identifies as being of African descent. And so we and I in this direct in this um, opted piece that I wrote shortly after that commercial was at uh, really goes into the details of why that is not true. Why, from a genetics perspective, we can actually use the genome to actually highlight some of the insensitive uh, the insensitive history as to why most African descent Americans have European ancestry in their genomes. But really, this was just an example of how a lot of genetic ancestry reporting to the lay public is not really fully being taken, um, I would say, their, our perspectives and how this information or knowing this information might make one feel is not really taken into account, right? And so it's doing the opposite of kind of building this trust if we don't take into the account the social and societal implications of learning one's genetic ancestry and what effect that might have on our um, on our on our well-being. And so this is a, a tweet from someone who does a lot of work in, I would say, uh, race reporting and, and, and politics. And she said, you know, she used a genetic ancestry company a few years ago, and she realized that she was more than 10% European, and she wept. And I think a lot of people uh, see reporting genetic ancestry as this very positive experience. Why wouldn't someone want to know all of this uh, information. But if we really think about the history of one, why do most Black people not know uh, their genetic ancestry or their genetic history? Uh, we're not actually considering the type of trauma it might elicit. And so this is an example of that. Another thing um, that has become somewhat of an issue is the transparency about the results and particularly the accuracy of genetic ancestry results. And so, again, the marketing scheme of if we report genetic ancestry, you now have your identity, your long lost identity. Um, but we're actually not even talking about is the reporting that you're getting back from genetic ancestry companies actually accurate? Um, or the return of other results. And so I'll talk a little bit about um, some other benefit models where people are sharing uh, other types of actionable genetic, and, well, I should say actionable uh, genetic results for health purposes. And then most importantly, uh, the transparency on the use of the data. And so one example of, in going back to the transparency of the use of the data, is one of these genetic ancestry companies, a lot of genetic ancestry companies, I should say, are actually thinking about, well, how can the data be used, right? And so I don't really believe that the intention when collecting this data was to share it with for-profit organizations, but that is kind of what happened. And one, uh, one of these stories we tell on the podcast um, in an episode 
around a story where 23andMe uh, sold genetic information to GSK in a deal that was worth $300 million. And so really, um, I go back to what is the transparency? And so in this case, we're doing the opposite of trust building. We're actually breaking trust by not really fully telling participants uh, what the use of that data might be. And so you might imagine uh, someone might want to contribute or be a part of a consumer genetic ancestry database because of the value of getting their genetic ancestry uh, or the perceived value of getting their genetic ancestry, but then not know what, the, what happens with the data after. And a lot of that has to do with the transparency. A lot of that also has to do um, with just really trying to understand all of the forms and things that you sign. But going back to uh, some of the things that we could do work on and some of the things we can build trust, because I do believe giving back or any form of information is a tool to better engage with communities. I think we just have to think about doing it right. And so one of the things that we do on In Those Genes podcast is we try to give the full story. So we try to build trust through transparency. And we really use science education as a tool to kind of create that. And so in this clip, I'm talking about um, the accuracy of the consumer genetic, uh, consumer genetic ancestry test and getting that data back. All right, so tell me what it was like from ordering the test to getting your results. So yeah, it was, I think the price had dropped to like, mm -hmm. from like a hundred something dollars to 75 or something like that. So you 79. out here checking for $24. Yeah, All I'm right. looking for the, yeah. No, mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's how you get it. Yeah, I think ours was a hundred for two, so it was crazy. Oh, okay, it so they really, they really out here cutting deals. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a hell of a deal. Then it comes in the mail. It was like a special little box, right? Okay. You open the box. It was cool because you opened the box. It had a cool little presentation. It was like a it kit. was a cool presentation. It was like a kit. It was like a kit. You just pop open like it was oh, like this a Coachella cool. box, right? Exactly. It was it like, was. like it was. It was. And how do you actually give a DNA sample? So you spit. How much spit are we talking here? It was uh, like it was six like, ounces, four ounces, maybe not even. Like a not little that two. much. It was a two. Oh so God. it was like that's a lot of spit. It was two. like a. It was like three spits. I felt like. <laughs> Personally, haven't done samples from saliva before. It's not fun. It's not fun. So saliva one. is not is not the best way. It's to, not to isolate DNA. Oh, this is not high yield. Oh so there are several ways to get a DNA sample. DNA is in each one of the cells that make up the human body. Most common forms of samples include blood, saliva, hair, sperm, and even skin. But they do not all give the best quality DNA. The best way to extract DNA is from a blood sample, but obviously this is not something you would do on your own for an ancestry test. So what you do is you spit. While this method does not yield a lot of DNA, after extraction, the data quality is good enough. Once there is enough DNA extracted, we can replicate the DNA and store it for future use, which is called biobanking. So after you spit, you ship it out, and then what? You said it took like six to eight weeks or something to get it back. And while you were waiting, what results did you think you were going to get? Or what results were you hoping to get? I wanted a little bit of Ghana. Why? I wanted... What kind of Ghana? Uh, just because I think Ghana Ghanaians are dope. I feel. Um, so that's an example of how, and I misspoke earlier. This is a different clip, but I'm going to play the clip that I was intended to play. This is an example of how we can use uh, culturally attuned uh, science communication to teach exactly what the tests are doing and therefore create and build trust on taking the test. And so knowing a little bit more about how and all the different steps that come in taking a test will make someone feel more comfortable about doing it. And in this next clip, I'm talking about um, the accuracy. Janina, Janina, I just yes. want to let you know that we are just about at time. So we'll have to wrap this oh. up shortly after this clip. back to the transparency and what these results can tell us. And this is an example, uh, this is another example of polygenic risk scores, where basically a risk score of, of your genetic risk offer multiple variants for a common or complex disease. Many of these were defined in a European descent population and many don't translate to African descent populations. And so being transparent about how accurate are genetic ancestry tests? What are they being used for? And even reporting back results like medical results, how applicable are they to other populations is important. 
Um, that's not to say, basically what I'm saying is that we're trying to end this idea of transactional research by creating equally beneficial sharing models. There are a couple of different models that are currently being used. Um, one of them is an individual interest model where you as an individual, you contribute your DNA and you get a, a bit of the profit. Another one that has been, um, I would say, probably more often used in, in kind of the center of what we're talking about today is this idea of participation in the collective interest model. So you participate in the study, in this case, all of us, and you would get the return of results for actionable genetic information um, and also getting genetic ancestry. Just again, making sure that we report this with transparency and giving full uh, full Full, not, full information about what these tests can and can't do. Variant Bio is another great example of a pharmaceutical company who was doing this work. And in addition to, uh, if you participate in their study, you get support for other things. And so these other things really do help make research and um, health disparities more equitable or eliminate health disparities altogether. So you can think about this as having support for healthcare, having support for education, research, capacity building, and even most importantly, revenue sharing. And so if your genetic information is being used, and yes, you get some data back, or if you don't get data back, it is also really, um, really, really, really empowering for an individual, particularly one of a disadvantaged background, to see some benefits, monetary benefits. And so they share 4% of the revenue that they get from anything, any drug discovery that comes out of your participation and bring that back. Um, I know my time was cut short. I didn't have a time to talk about a lot of things, but if you listen to the podcast, we have a couple of episodes on this. And also I have a TEDx talk that really talks about um, how we can get the most benefit out of sharing our genetic information. Thank you so much, Janina. Uh, but yeah, let's do Graham now. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you to Eduardo and others for inviting me. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. So... I thought I'd like to take a step back today and tools for our genetic ancestry are used in a range of different applications. I want to talk about and critique the use of genetic ancestry descriptors in human genetics. I'd be interested to hear people's views on this. And I want to say that I've just published a broader commentary on this, which is available on the archive under the title given here. Okay. So my take home messages from today's talk are, as we all know, genetic variation varies relatively smoothly across, in, across people, across the human population. And as a consequence of that, genetic populations are not real. Now, often as population geneticists or statistical geneticists, it's helpful for us to imagine a set of relatively discrete populations as a modeling construct but that easily leads to confusion amongst empiricists and methods developers about the reality of genetic populations. Genetic populations are a useful modeling construct, but they're not real. However, we do need ways to label samples in human genetic research. I'd argue that that's unavoidable in practice. We need labels in order to be able to communicate and combine family, uh, results across different studies, but it's a clear, it's clear that, that genetic ancestry and its use as a population uh, sample descriptor is a source of confusion. I'm going to argue that human genetics researchers should actually stop using genetic ancestry groups as a term for sample descriptors. In most applications, researchers actually just mean genetic similarity or relatedness to a, net, a set of known predefined samples, and we'd be better off using that terminology. Now, this is not a new set of points. There have been many people making these points over the uh, years. A couple of recent articles are highlighted here, both of which call for more precision about our descriptions of genetic ancestry. I differentiate myself slightly from those by saying actually most human, of human genetics should simply move away from the term genetic ancestry and move to walk back towards the more simple descriptor of genetic similarity. Okay, so genetic populations in humans are not real. In many different applications, in modeling, in statistical analysis, it's useful to imagine a set of relatively discrete populations in order to simplify our analysis. 
But those simple, discre relatively discrete populations don't exist out in the real world. As we all know, the reality is that we're all related to each other in varying extents in an unimaginably complicated family tree which connects us all. As a consequence of this, patterns of genetic relatedness or genetic similarity vary fairly smoothly across people. And those patterns of relatedness and genetic similarity are shaped in all sorts of interesting ways by geography, by environment, by population history. And there's a range of fascinating questions about how to learn about geography and environments and their importance in population history from patterns of genetic similarity. But we shouldn't distinguish that from the task of describing samples to each other in research. There's no simple single right level on which to describe human genetic structure. There's a whole different levels of population structure that we could talk about from very fine scale structure to very broad scale structure. And the level on which we want to talk about genetic structure, we depend on the question that we're trying to answer. All verbal descriptions that we can offer for patterns of human genetic relatedness will necessarily be incomplete and specific to the set of questions that we are addressing. And as a consequence of that, they're subject to misinterpretation and misuse when uh, simplified down to overly simple terms. Now, given that, why in human genetics do we make use of population descriptors of population labels in our analysis? Well, there's a variety of reasons that we could put offer forward. As a population geneticist engaged in human genetic research, I'd simplify it to a set of points which are key to thinking about the analysis of data. When we're trying to describe the patterns we see in data to each other, for example, if we're looking at a principal components plot describing human genetic variation in a particular sample, we see a series of patterns in that principal component plot, and we have to describe what those different axes of the principal component plot represent. How do they accord to the samples of which we sampled from the human population. Moreover, many statistical and population genetic methods and analysis fit uh, to their models to relatively homogeneous groups. Thus, in many human genetic analyses, samples are subset in order to get towards a slightly more homogeneous set of individuals on which to perform analysis. That comes with a whole set of caveats. But in order to subset the data, we need to describe how we subset the data and we need descriptors to describe those subsets. So for example, in genome-wide association studies, people look to drop down to a set of slightly more homogeneous samples, but they need to describe what set of individuals such analysis was conducted in. In human genetics, we're also often trying to combine data or data types and describe various sets of results. So for example, in genome-wide association studies, it's common now for various samples to be put together in a meta-analysis to increase the power of the genome-wide association study. But again, we need a descriptor of what set of individuals have been combined together. If we're talking about sets of allele frequencies or sets of polygenic predictions, again, we need labels, population descriptions, to describe the context of those results. And more generally, I'd argue that in many cases, we need population labels for sets of individuals because we're trying to communicate results to each other. And fundamentally that verbal communication is made easier by having simple just population descriptors that we're all familiar with. So we can understand a set of results and their scope. So one common set of sample descriptors applied to human genomic data are a set of genetically derived sample descriptors, that of genetic ancestry group. These ideas of genetic ancestry have clearly caught on. They're clearly very popular in personal genomics with companies like 23andAncestry.com making a lot of hay off their use. But I'd argue that they're often actually fairly misleading and open to misinterpretation. Before doing that and laying that out, I want to distinguish between two different but related concepts. The first of which is genetic ancestors, and the second of which 
are genetic ancestry groups. Genetic ancestors refers to the set of your ancestors, your biological ancestors, who you inherited your genome from. Those are a set of real people who lived in the past, who happen to contribute genetic material, which have been inherited to the present day and into your genome. However, your genetic ancestors are only a subset of your genealogical ancestors. For example, if we go back 450 years ago, you probably have around 32,000 living genealogical ancestors around 450 years ago, but only about a thousand of them contributes to your genome today. They'll have those ancestors may have contributed genetic material to other individuals as well, and those ancestors which have failed to give genetic material to you may have passed on genetic material to other people, but simply not to you. So your genetic ancestors are a subset and a relatively small subset of all of your genealogical ancestors. However, those genetic ancestors are what population genomic data can inform us about through your relatedness or genetic similarity to those ancestors and your relatedness or your genetic similarity to the other descendants of those ancestors who are living today. In describing patterns of population genetic data, we're often able to make quite precise statistical statements but any interpretation of those results comes from a set of geographical or sample descriptors which have been gathered when that data has been gathered, well, that's those samples have been collected. So always the results of population genomic data analysis, the results of genetic similarity are placed in the context of the society which collected that data and the geographic labels and the sample descriptors that they found useful to describe that data. So fundamentally, any label we apply to genetic data is going to be a social construct. Through computational and statistical advances, we're getting much more precise at describing some of the properties of our genealogical ancestors using approaches such as ancestry recombination graphs. We can now learn about our genetic relatedness across the entirety of our genome to tens of thousands of other individuals. And that's a really fascinating process, right? We're able to become really precise about the statements we're making about our patterns of relatedness to other individuals. But I'd argue that those representations are always going to be very high dimensional Many people hope that approaches such as these ancestral combination graphs will mean that we have to become more precise about ancestry. But in reality, I think we're always going to use relatively simple summaries of genetic data to assign genetic, to assign, uh, genetic sample descriptors. And so we want those labels to be relatively simple, easy to use, and relatively precise in their meaning. Okay, let's contrast that with what today human geneticists usually mean by genetic ancestry group. When we're talking about genetic ancestry group, people are usually using terms like European genetic ancestry, East Asian genetic ancestry, or African genetic ancestry. And those can seem like relatively precise labels, often coming with quantitative assessments of proportions of ancestry belonging to those different groups. But fundamentally, they're based on relatively simple sample descriptors. I'd argue that genetic ancestry group is nearly always a description of genetic similarity to some other set of predefined individuals using some simple summary statistic. So for example, what you're looking at here is a principal component graph where a set of individuals from the thousand genomes have been projected onto the first two principal components of their genotype data. On the basis of this, if you took my genotype and projected me onto this graph, I'd very likely fall near other individuals labeled as belonging to the European reference panel. On the basis of that, researchers might be tempted to say that I am of European genetic ancestry. However, that's a conclusion that's simply not, uh, that's being drawn on the basis of this graph the correct interpretation of me falling near these individuals on this principal components graph is simply a statement 
that I'm most genetically similar to those individuals in the European reference panel on these first two principal components. It's not a statement that I belong to some hypothetical genetic ancestry group. We can also use more precise statements of genetic ancestry using approaches such as structure or um, like structure-like approaches. In those cases, we get a relatively precise breakdown of an individual's genetic ancestry or seemingly precise uh, breakdown of an individual's genetic ancestry. For example, statements about an individual having 60% African ancestry, 40% European ancestry. Really, those are statements about the fact that 60% of this individual's genome is most similar to some other set of predefined individuals who are labeled as having African ancestry, and 40% of their genome be most similar to individuals labeled as having European like ancestry. And again, that reflects the fact that these statements are really a statement about genetic similarity with some hypothetical genetic ancestry group being placed on top of that interpretation. We see more Graham, precise is, statements along I'm the genome being made. Graham, this is your one minute warning. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. Where people talk about the ancestry broken along the genome. But again, those are statements about genetic similarity along the genome. The use of genetic ancestry sim, uh, group comes with a number of numerous issues, many of which have been highlighted by various people on this panel and elsewhere. The resolution identity of ancestry groups are a function of a set of reference samples that have been used. They usually bracket a specific time period, usually about 600 to a few thousand years ago, but that time period is often un left unsaid. And most importantly, those genetic ancestry descriptors often make use of very broad geographical labels and overlap racial labels, which is problematic because these modeling constructs that people are using quickly become reified into implying homogeneity within ancestry groups and hiding the continuity across ancestry groups, which is very problematic for uh, this linkage between genetic ancestry and its coupling to ideas about ongoing ideas about race. So on the basis of that, various responses can be offered forwards. There's often a call for more precise descriptions of ancestry, moving away from label, broad geographical labels on the continent to a scale, to more fine scale labels, talking about much more fine scale geographic labels. But if we have issues defining what we mean by these broad continental labels, I'd argue that we have even more issue talking about these very fine scale genetic la geographical labels, uh, which are even more recent time periods. And again, most of these statements are statements about genetic similarity rather than some hypothetical set of ancestral populations. Phrased in terms of genetic ancestors, statements about the geographical location of those genetic ancestors may be scientifically useful to geneticists and genetic anthropologists interested in learning more about human history. However, I'd argue that the vast majority of human genetics and human genetics research isn't actually concerned with learning about human history or personal genomics. They simply need population descriptions and sample description labels, which are useful and clear. And as a consequence of that, I'd argue that most of the human genetics is actually matching on the basis of genetic similarity and not on ancestry. The human geneticists are interested in making comparisons across samples and finding correct sets of controls. And so we should actually move away from using genetic ancestry groups as human geneticists and move towards using simple statements of genetic similarity, saying that this sample is genetically most similar to some other set of predefined samples using a specific metric. On the basis of that, it forces human geneticists to think more precisely about why they're using measures of genetic similarity, why they need to make matches to other samples and by what measure those matches may to be, need to be made by. It puts a focus on the sets of panels that we're using to judge genetic similarity, rather than thinking about some hypothetical set of genetic ancestry pop ancestral populations. And I'd argue that the use of genetic similarity does less to homogene homogenize within labels because saying sets of samples are similar to each other does not imply that they are the same as each other, nor do these labels of genetic similarity come with as much baggage as when we talk about 
genetic ancestry group. For all those reasons, I argue that human geneticists should stop using the label genetic ancestry group. Those labels may be useful in other applications, but in much of human genetic research, it will simply mean genetic similarity to a set of certain samples, and we'd be much clearer in our descriptions if we simply phrase them in terms of genetic similarity rather than harking towards some sets of genetic ancestry populations. And with that, I realize I run a couple of minutes over, but I'd like to thank everyone. I look forward to the questions and the other talks in the panel. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, let's go to Jen. Thank you. Jen, we are, we can hear you. I think yeah, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't find the mute button. <laughs> All right, so um, I'll be real quick because I think I only have, there's only 12 minutes left to the right now, but um, what I uh, am going to talk to you about today, oh, I can't start video, but if anyone wants to start it, you can do it, um, is that about genomic research and how we conceive of genetic ancestry. So I'll just jump right in. And so, you know, I want to sort of start off with this, this sort of tension that we have when we think of genetic ancestry and, and genomic research is that, you know, often you see in the literature that genetic similarity is, as Graham described, um, or genetic ancestry is conflated with the race ethnicity. And they're very different concepts. And there's this disconnect between them in terms of the technical motivations for why you would want genetic similarity um, versus sort of the downstream interpretations and implications of having these racial ethnic groups um, that exist uh, and how the consequences exist for society um, and health. And so, put there. Uh, it's important that these are not interchangeable, and so I'll try to be very clear as to which ones I'm talking about throughout this presentation, um, but just sort of something to go off of. And so, I'm a genetic epidemiologist, and so I typically think in terms of looking at the health of populations and sort of why there might be issues. And so we know there's genomic health inequities. Um, this exists in terms of access to health care in the first place due to various factors of structural racism and other factors. Um, and then even once you have access to health care, the actual tools that are available for genomic health can be different based on sort of racial ethnic groups. Um, and so, you know, we want to know you know, we've been working in genomic health for a long time, sort of how do we get here and, and why do we keep on making the same mistakes? And so when we're thinking about this, I think it's really important to note that it sort of turtles all the way down. And when I say that, what I mean is that this Eurocentric bias is kind of baked in at every single level. And this occurs from, you know, looking at recruitment and, and how we measure the genetics in the first place. Um, the methods that we use out of the box for discovery have certain assumptions. And then even when we go from discovery to translation, you know, which populations are prioritized um, and what do we think about a value of a tool and sort of value for who. And so all of these sort of really underscore the fact that we accept a certain construct as the default. And when it comes to genetic ancestry um, and race ethnicity, it's usually the sort of level of homogeneity and a European ancestry background. And this has sort of permeated every single level of how we do research. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you, most of my research is, is about better understanding this. Um, and then with the idea of sort of breaking out of this, you know, out of the box thinking, and not even just out of the box, really breaking the box entirely, because why do we even have it in the first place? It's kind of meaningless. Okay, so when we think about representation, um, we can look at the numbers. And so typically what we look at is the number of participants. And so the NHGRI EBI GWAS catalog is a resource that catalogs, you know, existing published GWAS with genome-wide association studies. And these are large scale studies looking at the association between variants and traits. Um, and they do this really great thing where they try to have some sort of accountability so we know who these studies are being done in. Um, and it should be noted that in order to do this and to harmonize across different contexts, they do collapse different constructs, and so they collapse race, ethnicity, geography, genetic ancestry, similarity, and nationality. Um, and so what you get on the right-hand side is just recently published, looking at the mean sample size. Often we look at the total number of participants, but I think it's really important to complementary look at the sample size per study, since that is typically the rate-limiting step for discovery as it determines statistical power. And what you can see is that over the past decade, the average sample size in terms of the cumulative knowledge base in the solid lines 
and the annual sort of publishing um, in the dashed lines has increased, but mostly for European groups here, as designated by the GWAS catalog. And if you look in the past five years below, just the non-European groups, um, you can see there's some progress, especially on an annual sort of basis, there's some fluctuations in 2022, mainly because of all of us, um, but it hasn't been that great. So we still have this, this discrepancy in terms of the actual representation. And I'll show you sort of why that matters in the next few slides, hopefully. And so I'm going to be talking about the PAID study, which is a, a study that I primarily work in. This is a population architecture using genomics and epidemiology study. Um, this was conceived of over a decade by NHGRI and some partners looking at U.S. minority populations. Um, and for this iteration of PAGE, when I got involved in it in 2014, it was primarily focused on GWAS. And so the idea being, how do we effectively do GWAS in diverse groups? Now, what I'm showing you here on the right-hand side is principal components analysis, um, output, each dot is a person, and they are categorized by how they self-identify. And so at this point in 2014, or whenever, you know, around the time, it was quite standard to do a stratified analysis where you'd stratify by these genetic ancestry groups that Graham described before, um, and then do a meta-analysis together. And so we looked at the samples that we had and we thought this makes no sense. It makes no sense to stratify this. There's no meaningful way to stratify these individuals to meet that certain assumption of homogeneity due to the large amounts of admixture and these sort of different dynamics of the populations. And so what we ended up doing is pulling everyone together due to the you know, emergence of these newer methods that can actually account for the relatedness directly. Um, and then we actually had added you know, power uh, for the GWAS itself. And if you want any more details, you can, um, it's in the paper, it means about 26 different GWAS and a lot of cool stuff in there. What I really wanna focus on today is how we move from GWAS to polygenic scores because polygenic scores are currently actually already being rolled out in the clinic and you know, there's well-known issues with ancestry um, and how we deal with it. And so as Janina mentioned before, it's sort of well-known that if you, if you develop a polygenic score, which is a basically you sum across effect sizes derived from a GWAS and you apply it to a different population, it doesn't do as well. And it's thought it's because of multiple factors, um, mostly because of allele frequency differences in LD, lignus equilibrium differences. Um, and so you can see that in page. So here what I did is I took a PGS for BMI that was developed in European groups um, and applied it to page participants. Again, stratified by their self-identified race ethnicity um, to sort of mimic if they came into the clinic, how would it work for, for them? And what you can see, first of all, there's a lot of difference in between how these, these, um, these risk score performs in the different groups. Um, and what you see here on the left-hand side is the difference between the adjusted R squared which is sort of looking at BMI and continuous trait, and the AUC for obesity if we dichotomized it, you know, with a 30 as the cutoff. And what you see is that there's differences, and I want to really focus on the Asian group here, which has a pretty low adjusted R squared, um, but a higher AUC. And that's partly because when we think about the performance of this risk score, it's no different than any sort of other clinical risk scores, and therefore it is um, susceptible to the same dynamics you would find in regular epidemiological risks which is on the right-hand side, because the prevalence of this outcome is so low, even though on a continuous scale it doesn't do great, it, it can have a boost in performance. So just to say that between these different racial ethnic groups, we see differences due to multiple factors. Now when we think about ancestry, I wanna focus in a little bit more. So we've had a lot of literature looking between populations. And what I wanna focus on is within a population. So within a population, what role does ancestry have in biomedical research? And so I'm gonna focus on Hispanic Latino groups where the majority of my research is focused. Um, and so what does the label Hispanic Latino even mean when it comes to genetic ancestry? It can be both an imprecise and inaccurate measure. What I'm showing you here is um, admixture plots. Uh, every person is a vertical line and they are colored by the portion of their genome um, with inferred ancestry to a specific component as designated on the right-hand side here. And so what you see is there's a large amount of heterogeneity within these groups due to a lot of factors, historical factors, um, colonialism, enslavement, sort of everything coming together. And so what you can see is that there's a large amount of heterogeneity within this Latino group. And then further, if you allow people to further self-identify themselves, um, even more heterogeneity, both between and within groups. So, so you have layers and layers of this heterogeneity that you don't really have to account for with some other populations. But for this, it's sort of this, this label is just hiding these different layers of heterogeneity and structure. 
And so I'm an epidemiologist um, at my core. And so when I think about how ancestry influences this, I'm gonna sort of look at these sort of graphs that we should have here. And so the relationship we really care about is this PRS to BMI. Um, there's a positive relationship between the two, which is what we want. We want the actual PRS to be showing us what the outcome is. Um, but what we do see on the top left-hand side is that we have actually a pretty strong relationship between the PRS and portion of um, indigenous to the Americas ancestry. This can be because of two reasons, really. It can be because it's a real relationship that's actually informative for the outcome and therefore we wanna keep it in, um, or it's a false relationship that we need to account for. And what we see on the right-hand side here um, is that it's a false relationship that we wanna get rid of. And so we need to sort of cut it all out. And so moving forward, and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly so the figures don't really matter, so the conclusions, um, is that adjustment very complicated when it comes to these. And what I'm gonna show you in the next few slides is how complicated everything gets. And I think it's an underappreciated part of how we consider ancestry in genomic research. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is before and after adjustment for um, portion of ancestry for the indigenous the America component there. And really what you need to know is that, you know, often we consider the means. But when it comes to this large amount of heterogeneity, we really have to consider the thick streams and the level of variance in the population, where you have this differential performance and differential sort of adjustment that occurs based on ancestry within the populations, not between, but within what we've designated to be a population. And so what you can see sort of on the right hand side again is that if you have more indigenous ancestry, your risk goes down after the adjustment. And if you have less, then it goes up. And so again, you have this sort of bow tie effect. And so when we come to sort of the, you know, we wanna, we wanna have one fix it all, tell me what to do with this. I can't tell you what to do with it because it's very complicated. And what I'm showing you here is that based on different admixture proportions, this way is a three-way mostly admixture, um, how you adjust for ancestry has different differences, right? On how well the score does. And so this is just to show that there's this intersection of which population it is, the ancestry composition and the outcome, which affect all of this. Um, and I know we're running out of time, so I will go fast through these. And so this is reflected, I guess, in what I want to say is that it's reflected at the more granular level between these groups, where you see adjustment has this differential benefit or, or not a benefit based on both the admixture ancestry as well as the environment between these groups. And we can go even further from this. This is a paper that was led by Lindsay Fernandez Rose at Penn and Kristen McCardle uh, that I participated in. And what you can see here is that they looked at the um, interaction between immigration, so age and immigration, um, and a polygenic risk score for BMI and performance. And really the main things you need to know for this is that the model fits different by background, even after you adjust for the genetic ancestry components of this through principal components. And then also what you see is that the effect, the actual interaction between the risk score and immigration actually differs between these different groups at the bottom here. Um, and this is all robust to adjustment for ancestry. So a grad student in my group, JSC Sharma, um, looked at this and found it robust. The idea being that you have a very, very complex dynamic when it comes to ancestry, where ancestry intersects with the environment, which intersects with you know, the genetic components here, which you're looking at, and to think of it all in terms of one or the other is really to do a disservice and not understand the very complex interaction between race, ethnicity, and genetic ancestry when it comes to health and human health for modeling. I just want to have a little bit of a shout out um, and for another work that we've been doing, right, which is that, you know, for, for the groups I just talked about, admixture kind of defines the group. But what happens when admixture prevents somebody from belonging to a group? And so this is what occurs in multiracial individuals, which actually are currently just like left out of all genomic research um, in general. And so some place to look at, there's a preprint that's available if folks are interested in sort of what's going on there. And so uh, I know we're sort of over already, but um, I'm gonna conclude by saying that, you know, as we move towards these precision health frameworks, it's important for us to check ourselves and sort of ask precise for who, um, and really have those questions. Um, and with that, I have a lot of people to thank for help with these projects and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jen, and thank you, um, all the three speakers. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talks and also the participants. Um, please send your questions. We um, went a little bit over time, but uh, if all the speakers agree, if they can stay for um, five minutes or so, we can maybe ask a couple of questions. Um,
I'll start with one of the questions that uh, one of the participants asked. Um, and I'll complement it a little bit, but uh, this person says many medical or clinical measures use categorical ratio groups. Should we move to genetic ancestry? And I'm adding, or should we move to something completely different? Um, and what would it be? I can speak briefly to this, and, and I'm going to give every epidemiologist's favorite answer, which is that it depends. Um, it'll depend on, on the population. It'll depend on whether genetic ancestry or you know, race ethnicity matters. I think that there's a lot of research that's being done on this, this front to sort of disentangle these different dynamics and sort of why you would use it versus not. Uh, and then I would just also caution us not to have one blanket approach for everything because we know it's sort of very complicated. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Would anyone else like to, to say? something? Yeah, I guess I'd echo Jen's comments, which is that it depends on the question that we're trying to answer. I guess I'd argue in many applications, we would think that adjusting, collecting data on genetic similarity and using that as a sample descriptor is useful, but that doesn't mean that sample descriptors based on race or ethnicity aren't capturing important things about the environments that individuals experience on average. And so that can be a useful label in human genetics, a useful attribute in human genetics in order for getting more information about environments and how they may predispose individuals' health outcomes. Thank you. Janina, would, would you like to add something or? Okay. I'll, I'll ask another question, very interesting question from uh, also the audience. Um, uh, this question is, I think all of you could, um, answer could approach. So this person saying, I was wondering what you think about other academic fields adopting genetic terms for describing populations they work with. So there are archaeologists using ancestry and admixture terminology to coincide with identified morphological features, linguistics, etc. So what do you think about that, these other fields using um, genetic terms? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think it can be unhelpful because I think it blends terms across fields in confusing ways already in the term ancestry. It's confusing what we're talking about, whether we're talking about a person's heritage, mm -hmm. a person's genetics. And if we then move that over to aspects of phenotype or other measures, I think, again, that gets even more confusing. I think we should be clear in the terms we use clearly define them and make sure that there's not confusion over fields and sort of mixing over fields between definitions. But I guess I'd be interested to hear others' views on that. Thank you. Um, one question also uh, that we had uh, prepared before, we, one of the focuses of, one of the ideas of this webinar was to focus on genetic ancestry testing because we are in the end of the year and many people consider uh, purchasing that for um, gifts, as gifts. So what is the major concern, in your opinion, that an individual should have when taking a genetic test, a genetic ancestry test? Consider also that they also include like health um, 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 risk, uh, uh, health information, right? Yeah, I mean, this is not something a lot of consumer genetic ancestry uh, owners like to hear, but I think one of the biggest things is genetic counseling and really understanding what the information you are getting back is and what it's not. Um, I think that uh, you have some good examples where there's some educational material when you get the results back, but I think largely uh, there's still not enough education on what the results mean. Uh, other things like privacy, other things like 
where where does the data exist? What happens to my data? What type of information I'm getting? I think a lot of people don't realize that by contributing to a data set or contributing your genetic information, you're not just sharing your information, you're also the sharing information of people in your family. And so I think kind of really uh, just being able to learn as much as possible about all of the things that come along with doing a, a consumer genetic test is really important. But I'd say if I had to prioritize them, especially in giving back those health reports, um, having a genetic counselor or having someone who can help interpret those results is fundamental. And then the other thing I just wanted to add on to what Graham was saying uh, in the last question, I think actually our, our discipline or uh, the discipline of human genetics and more of these papers around guidance around how we use genetic ancestry versus genetic similarity and how we, uh, how we identifier, I should say, um, state that these are social constructs versus not social constructs. We are really the field that should be laying the landscape on how these things should be used. So I'm really hoping that a lot of these papers continue to roll out to kind of give best practices um, to researchers, not just in genetics, but in also other disciplines on how to use or not use these terms and when to use them. And so, yeah, I think that answers both. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let's have one more question and then I'm going to uh, copy all the questions and send to you by email. And maybe if you have time, you could answer by email and we would post in our website. Uh, but just one more question to wrap up. Um, someone is asking, I appreciate the disparities in genomic data and how that holds back drug discovery for pharma. But since we know most health disparities between racial, ethnic, um, ancestry identity groups are due to social and environmental determinants, how likely are underrepresented communities to realistically benefit from advancements in MED that result from their participation in genomic research? Given that the exclusion and lack of access to healthcare is already the major driver of disparities in the US. Gina, I saw that you unmuted. Do you wanna go first? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I was going to say, uh, this is a really t difficult question to answer, um, because I think seeing the benefit of, of contributing is um, very layered. But I would say one benefit that I've seen that I, I think is really valuable is really actually the, the, um, the findings themselves. So Jen does a lot of work on this, like a lot of the findings themselves that are now being reported back to patients. Um, have a lot of biases are a lot of times really not transferable to other populations. And so the more that people are contributing, the more that we learn from the data, even if there are, even if that means uh, correcting a, a, a misdiagnosis, that is still, I think, helpful. I do think, though, that now a lot of the, a lot of these large consortiums that are, you know, trying to get a lot of diverse samples to participate in these studies are really trying to change their um, benefit models too. And so you see a lot of people now not only offering a return of results, but also offering support um, for findings, also offering support for healthcare, support for genetics education. And so I think all of these things are, we're just scratching the surface, but all of these things are kind of hoping to help get us to that equal beneficial uh, model. Okay. Uh, would you like to add something, Jen? Yeah, I mean, I just, I want to echo everything that Jan just said. Um, but also on top of that, you know, there, I think, I mean, in my own work, what I try to sort of disentangle is what is, will have the maximum benefit. It's true, you know, in social environmental interventions will have the most benefit in terms of that versus not having any benefit, right? Which is that by expanding the knowledge base, there are real benefits, you know, day by day, year by year, in terms of the knowledge base growing for patients. Um, primarily, when you're looking at genetic counseling and sort of looking at these um, or monogenic disorders and the false negatives that occur in these underrepresented populations. And so there is real benefits. Um, and you can see this in terms of screening, in terms of um, for cancer screenings. You can see this in terms of prenatal screenings, how there's a lot of these tools that are currently not even available to other groups. Um, and so there are some real benefits for that in the media future. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank you once more, the speakers. Um, also thank the organizers um, of, the, um, of this webinar and the um, AABA, Triple AG,
and also the everyone who um, is participating and came to uh, to uh, to view the, the the talks. Thank you very much. As I said before, I have some questions that we didn't answer. Sorry for that, but I will um, try. We will post it in our website. Uh, some answers to that. Thank you very much, and um, I'll see you in the next webinar.